your name We're pressing on towards that day We're never gonna stop
house. Amen. We sing of your love, God. We sing that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in Jesus' name. God, we are so grateful to sing to you, to sing of your amazing love. God, it is furious and fighting for us. Would you just sing this chorus out, Mary Elizabeth? She leads us. Sing to him. His love is deep, his love is wide, and it covers us. His love is fierce, his love is strong, it is furious. His love is sweet, his love is wild, and it's waking hearts to lie.
thank you for your love. Amen. Are you so grateful for the love of Jesus? Amen. He is so good to us. And it is so great to see you here at A2. Thank you for choosing to be with us, to worship our God together with us. We are going to take this time now to dismiss our A2 kids. And then, guys, we love this time. It is our connect time. And we just ask that you move from one place to another. Go introduce yourself. Meet some new people. Thank you. everyone and welcome to A2 Church, especially if this is your very first time to be with us. If you came with a friend or family member, or maybe you're just new to church in general, we're thrilled to have you. Today we're continuing our new series called Escape from Zombie Land. If you've ever felt trapped in a lifeless job or caught in a lifeless relationship, if you've ever just felt lifeless, this series is for you. Two of our goals at A2 are one, that you'll know you matter to God and to us. You're important and you count. Two, that you won't leave here with any questions unanswered. With that being said, in the seat in front of you, you'll find a connection card. Take it out, fill it out, and drop it in the container that's going to pass at the end of the service. There's room on the back for you to let us know about your experience at A2 today. For both guests and regulars, there's also a place on the back to let us know how we can pray for you this week as well. If you've made a decision to follow Jesus, the next step in your spiritual journey is water baptism. Water baptism is an opportunity for you to share what Jesus Christ has done for you with your friends, family, and church. The next opportunity for you to take this step is Sunday, April 13th. Sign up by marking your connection card this morning. Make certain you share your contact info. We'll look forward to celebrating your new life with you on Sunday, April 13th. It's that time again. Time to man up and enjoy an old-fashioned breakfast. Billy Walker's and crew will be preparing bacon, sausage, eggs, made-to-order omelets, biscuits, and more. It's all free, so sign up via the connection card today. And ladies, this is men's only. Are you new to A2? Do you want to learn more about who we are and what we're about? Then make plans to join us immediately following today's worship experience. That's right, immediately following this morning's experience, you can join us for next. We'll share the mission, values, and ministry of A2. A light lunch and child care will be provided. Just go to the area in the foyer with the huge signs marked next immediately following today's experience and a team member will greet you there. If you have any questions about anything you see or hear today, please stop by the guest services desk located in the foyer. Don't forget to check out our website at a2church.org where you can get info about all the events happening at A2. You can also download free podcasts of all of our worship experiences. Again, thanks for being with us. We're here every Sunday, and we want to invite you to join us again. We're glad you've joined us for Easter and the new series, Escape from Zombieland. Hey, it's me again. Wandering around, indulging in whatever's in front of me. I know, I know. Still haven't gotten that whole posture thing down. I could really use a shower. I should eat better. What else would you expect? I'm a zombie. Hi, can I take your order? Uh, 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 uh. Um, can I take your order, please? Uh, uh. We have burgers, corn dogs, chicken fingers. Fingers. You want chicken fingers? Fingers. Okay, anything else? anything you're saying. What's wrong with me? Why do I do this stuff? Why do I keep going back to the same old habits, same old behaviors, same old things that made me this way? 
I don't like this. I want to be new. I want to be free. I want to escape. Maybe I shouldn't be so hard on myself. I mean, we're all dead. Wandering around, overindulging in the things we wish we could break free of. Going back to the habits, hangups, and hurts that just make us feel lifeless. And, well in my case, dead. Discover how you can come alive. Not like me, but really alive. Messages in the series include new way to be human, loving a zombie, breaking away from the herd, talk to me. This series is not about therapy. It's about experiencing a resurrection. So I hope you and all your other zombie friends will join us for the rest of Escape from Zombieland. Good morning. I um, just want everyone to know, um, first off, that's not what I really look like. Um, <laughs> second off, no zombies were harmed in the filming of that video. Um, no drive through attendants were harmed either. <laughs> so uh, the, mu the ushers are moving into place. Uh, this is your opportunity, if you call this place home, to honor God with uh, his tithe and our offering. If you're a guest, we don't ask our guests to give anything. Um, we hope that this service, this experience has been our gift to you. Um, this is also going to be everyone's opportunity to drop in those connection cards we talked about earlier in the video. Uh, Ephesians 2, 4 through 6 says, Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Jesus Christ. This series is about the hope we have because of Jesus. It's about the reality that Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make the dead come to life. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you so much that we can come together, worship you. And uh, just as Chris comes to deliver the message, please open our hearts. Please allow us to sink in. And please just let us leave here a little more alive than when we came. Um, help us to have a great day and honor you. And as we go throughout the week, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
and the band. Oh, that was awesome. That was awesome. They're going to bring up the house lights, and as they do, uh, I want to point out somebody to you, a couple of people. Go ahead and bring up those house, house lights, Bethany, if you would. Uh, Billy Walters, if you would stand, please, and Greg Gilbert. I know Greg's somewhere around here. Greg's all the way back in the back. Um, Tonight is our monthly night to serve dinner at the village. And they're actually uh, grilling an incredible feast for our friends, residents, and staff at the village. It's a community that provides rehabilitation, restoration, re-entry ministry. They need help tonight in serving that meal. Uh, They're cooking it all the way up from the ground up. See Billy or Greg. Guys, if you would be somewhere dominant, maybe over there at the information desk, immediately following this morning's service, um, see these guys. Uh, One more thought. If you're here, they already announced it on the screen, but maybe you don't know how open this invitation is. If you're here, you want to learn more about A2, whether you have a reservation or not. Right back there in my right-hand corner, there's some couches now. Uh, We'll set that up appropriately. There's a team that'll get on that right after church. And uh, we'd love for you to stay for next. We've got a great meal for you. And we'll only talk about 25 minutes. So join us. Hey, if you've got your Bible, open to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. And uh, let me take this off. Um, Sorry, it's the best I could find on short notice on a day like today. Most people want to be something new. Uh, This is why the self-help section in every bookstore is huge. It is why self-help books, magazines, are among the most popular on the planet. It's why some of the most watched television shows, most traffic blogs, websites, are all focused on one thing, becoming a new and better you. Uh, All of us, whether we're Christian or not, all of us seem to intuitively know something is wrong. Uh, We're not entirely who we should be or who we could be. And we feel that tension. And most of us sense the gap. We just tend to disagree on how we bridge the gap, how we reduce the tension. So I want to ask a series of questions this morning. Um, Here's the question. Suppose someone who doesn't know God, someone far from the heart of God, who's never even had a thought about God, starts attending A2 Church. They attend weekend worship experiences every Sunday. They plug into a small group. They have a group of friends who are praying for them like crazy lights out. And all of a sudden, something happens. They do it. They cross the line of faith. This person becomes a believer. They get serious. They become an individual who is fully devoted to Christ. They pass, just like the song just said, right out of Ephesians 2, that song was taken. They pass from death to life. They were once dead in transgressions and sin, but they come alive and they're made new. Let's suppose they hang out at A2 Church for the next five years. Here's the question, what do we expect? What do we think ought to happen in that individual's life? What do we believe a person who's completely sold out to Jesus looks like? If a person has really passed from being dead in transgressions and sin to being made alive in Christ, and as the song said, raised up and seated with Jesus in heavenly places, what does that look like? Now, this is something that amazes me. Most churches never provide a clear picture of what we ought to expect when somebody becomes a follower of Jesus. We have some assumptions. They aren't outrightly discussed. But if you grew up in the church I grew up in, we definitely had some assumptions. church I grew up in, flashback a lot of years, the church I grew up in, If you became a follower of Jesus, we immediately assume that you wouldn't drink, smoke, cuss, or chew, and we tend to add or run around with girls who do. That was just common belief system in that era. We believe you wouldn't move rhythmically to music. In other words, you wouldn't dance. 
We believe that you wouldn't vote for a candidate from the wrong political party, and we all knew what the wrong political party was. I'll leave it open to your speculation. If you were a girl, church I was raised in, you wouldn't wear makeup, you wouldn't wear earrings or other jewelry other than your wedding band. You would not, if you were a girl, get your hair cut. If you were a guy, you would get your hair cut which means Jesus and Justin Kutcher wouldn't fit in at that church. It's really interesting when I think back upon the church I was raised in, what we expected involved things you wouldn't do. The church I grew up in was really, really, really legalistic. I went to my first movie in my 20s. We focused on a lot of don'ts. We rarely, if ever, got around to discussing the do's, the stuff you would do if you followed Christ. It's unfortunate, but there were a lot of things we did not expect. It's unfortunate, but if a person looked right, if they got the outward attire right, we gave them a pass. There were a lot of things we didn't expect. For instance, we didn't expect that you would put away resentment. We didn't expect that people who had been feuding in the church, people who had serious disagreements with one another, and sometimes in our church there were people who got into outright fights and feuds. We didn't expect that they would reconcile and begin to genuinely love one another. Or we didn't expect that the guy or gal who had been cranky for the last 40 years, he would suddenly become joyful and kind. We just sort of expected them to stay cranky. In fact, we expected them to crank all the way to the grave. It would have surprised us if they stopped being cranky. We didn't expect somebody who had been selfish and self-serving all of their life to become sacrificial and begin honoring God and blessing others with their resources. We didn't expect sour, negative, self-righteous, judgmental people to become sweet, positive, kind, humble, encouraging. In fact, if they had taken on that persona, we would have looked at them and said, what happened to you? What changed? This is amazing and sad. If truth be known, we didn't expect people to radically and completely change. We didn't expect them to become something new. And it wasn't because we were focused on grace. Remember, we were legalist to the core. I believe it's because we had such a low view of the gospel of Jesus. We didn't believe that the power of the gospel can change us radically from the inside out. Now, I'm aware whenever you begin to discuss radical transformational change, the moment you get close to talking about issues like holiness, purity, People in our culture get really, really nervous, and they say stuff like this, hey, hey, time out. At A2 Church, we're not into expectations. We're not into holiness. We're not into purity. We're into grace. Grace. But get this, grace is precisely why. Grace is precisely why the writers of the New Testament expected people who had placed their faith in Jesus to radically change and transform. See, a complete view of grace understands that grace isn't just about forgiveness. Grace isn't just about sins forgiven and forgotten. Grace is God's power made available to bring about radical, transformational, revolutionary change in you from the inside out. Listen listen to what Paul said. 2 Corinthians, it is not in your notes, but it will come up on the screen. In fact, if you don't have a Bible, take out your notes. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God is able to make, wow, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will, could you just say the next word out loud, abound in every good work. You'll abound not because you're trying really, really hard. You'll abound not because the legalists are standing over you, cracking a whip, saying, you ought to be like this, you ought to do that. You'll abound because the moment grace goes to work in you and on you, 
it begins to transform you from the inside out. And it is radical. It is revolutionary. And I want to tell you, once you experience it, you will never be the same. In fact, I'm going to say something radical, something that's going to upset a lot of you right now. Aren't you glad you signed up for this church service? If you're here and you say, Chris, I've been a Christian all my life. If you're here and you say, Chris, I've been a Christian all my life. Now, we could, we could talk about the semantics of the way you might say it. But let me just say, if you think you've been a Christian all your life, you're not. You're not. Because you can't encounter the radical, revolutionary grace of Jesus and stay the same. I'm telling you, once you encounter his amazing grace, he radically begins not a makeover. He begins this radical transformation. Uh, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity, he wrote about this. He said some people think that when they come into a personal relationship with Jesus, and I'll really do a poor paraphrase of what he wrote so eloquently and beautifully. He said they think that Jesus comes into their life to just do some mediocre, modest homeowner improvements, a little exterior addition. But what blows most people away is that when Jesus comes in, he begins tearing down walls. He begins taking off the roof. He begins expanding the premises because Lewis says his intent is not to just add on a room, but to build a castle in which the king himself can come to reside. Isn't that good? Now, Ephesians 4 deals with this. And remember, we're camping out in the book of Ephesians for the next few weeks, and it's going to be a, hopefully a cool journey for us. And listen to what Paul says, and then I'll try to walk this out in short order. He's talking to people who were dead in trespasses and sin, but they've been made alive with Christ, made to sit with him in heavenly places. And this is what he says, verse 17. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. He's going to give us a description of our B.C. existence. Futile thinking, they are darkened in their understanding. They are separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they're just calloused and insensitive they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge every kind of impurity and they are full of greed they have this attitude of more 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 i've just got to have more and if i just have something else that will heal the inner ache and longing that however is not the way of life you learn when you heard about Christ and were taught in him accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to, everybody say the next few words out loud with me, put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. See, this series is about leaving zombie land, not living there. Now, this series recognizes the fact that there is a lifelessness that pervades our world since the fall of humanity in Genesis 3. But God never called us to lifelessness. Jesus came that we might have life and have it to the full. This is an invitation to leave, exit, escape zombie land and experience life the way God intended it so how do i do that how do i put zombie land in the rear view let me give you four simple steps first of all make a decision make a decision uh, this whole passage is wrapped around verse 22 and 24 put off your old self put on the new self it's really interesting. The verb Paul uses means to strip off like you would take off a filthy, worn out, messed up, funky-fied, useless shirt. 
It means to strip off like you're taking off an old, worn-out set of dirty clothes. And here's what's really interesting to me. I don't attempt to get into the Greek very often in our worship experiences, but this is so important. These verbs that Paul uses in this text are in what's called the aorist tense. And here's what that means. It means a once and forever action. It refers to a single past finished action that took place the moment you became a Christian. Paul is basically looking at these guys and he's saying, hey guys, 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 don't forget you put off the old self. You put on the new self. This is something Paul is saying you've already done. It is a finished action. Here's the point. If you really want to put zombie land in the rear mirror, if you really want to become a new and different kind of person, it's going to require this, a concrete, deliberate, conscious, decisive, resolute, firm, determined decision. You've got to reach the point where you look back on everything that has been and determine, I don't want this. I don't want these filthy rags. I'm tired of living like this. Messed up and unfulfilled. You have to look forward to the life being offered and say, I want Jesus. I want what he offers. I want to pursue the life that he and he alone can give. That's who I want to be. And there comes a point where you make a decision. Anybody remember that old hymn we used to sing? I think we ought to sing it. A little more, even though we rarely sing hymns at our church. But maybe you can help me. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Listen to the next word. No turning back. Have you done that? If you really want to leave Zombieland, it requires that kind of decision. Now, our church, the nature of it, a church for people who've given up on church, church for people with hang-ups, hurts, habits. Our church ministers to encounters a lot of people with a past steeped in addiction. And my heart is real sensitive here because I have a couple of brothers who have struggled with addiction and one brother who continues to struggle with an ongoing addiction well into his 30s. Uh, Some of you are familiar with the 12 steps in recovery programs. Uh, The 12 steps have provided an incredible vehicle for addicts to move towards freedom. What's interesting is that when a person walks into a 12-step program who is an avowed alcoholic or addict, who basically finds it impossible to stop drinking, impossible to stop taking drugs, which of the 12 steps, if you're familiar with this, which of the 12 steps reads like this, try really, 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 really hard to stop drinking? Which of the steps reads like this, try really, 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 really hard to stop shooting up? None of them. Not one. None of the 12 steps say anything even close to now decide you're not going to drink anymore. One of the most powerful tools that has been developed to help people experience freedom over one of the most powerful addictions, never ask people to stop doing what they were doing because they've tried it before. It didn't work. Instead, let me me give you the first three steps. Are you ready? Here they are. Step one, we've admitted we were powerless and that our lives have become unmanageable. We just basically say, this is the truth about me. I'm not going to hide anymore. I find it amazing that people don't find such freedom in that. I minister to people almost every week who can't make that admission about a variety of issues in their life. Whether it's out of control anger, a porn addiction, they will never just surrender and say, I'm powerless. 
and I can't do anything about what is gripping me. My life has become unmanageable. Step number two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Now, they leave it to some nebulous power beyond ourselves. We know who that power is. We have experienced him personally. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God to salvation. And salvation there doesn't just mean sins forgiven. It means wholeness in life. Step number three, though, and it's right where we have landed today in this first principle. Make a decision to turn our wheel and our lives over to the care of God. I'll just leave that up for a moment. Have you done that? It is a strange thing. If you try to overcome your past, if you try to overcome your problems, your addictions, your sin, your old life, your junk, whatever it is, by your own will, you will inevitably fail. But if you come to God and say, I surrender. And back then, when I received you, I put off the old self and I put on the new. There's hope. Now, he tells us why it's really difficult for us to take that step. Look at what he says in verses 17 through 19, and I'll just give you the bullets. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Well, time out. They were Gentiles. But he says, he's writing to Gentiles. But he says, don't live as the Gentiles do. He's letting them know something. Sometimes we get so comfortable in our culture that we assume the characteristics of the culture without even knowing culture has defined us. Don't live like the Gentiles do. In, and he describes the way they live, the futility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding. They're separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening or callousness of their hearts. They've lost all sensitivity, and they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they're just full of greed. Three characteristics of zombified people. You ready? Let me just fill in these so I can get to the hope. Futile, empty, or purposeless. Don't live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Uh, pa- Paul is saying there comes a point in the life of everyone who decides to follow Jesus Christ where they look back on their B.C. life and they realize, wow, that was just so futile. My life before Jesus was meaningless and purposeless. I didn't realize it then, but without God, there was no point in existence. See, what they're confessing is what Paul said. In him we live. In him we move. In him we have our being. So life apart from Christ means nothing. Two, he says, they're hardened and callous. What does that mean? That means it's tough for the gospel to penetrate. Three, they're enslaved by Self-interest and self-centeredness driven by appetites, lust, desires. That's the truth about zombie. If you've not read up on your zombie literature, they're just read by or driven by impulse, right? They want to do one thing. They don't want to eat. They don't want to make love. They want to, anybody know what they, they want to Eat. Let's just leave it at eat. Let's not talk about what they want to eat. They just want to eat, right? And Paul says, before Christ, we're just driven. And sometimes it's more outwardly apparent than at other times. But we're all driven by self-interest and self-centeredness. But there comes this point when we look back and we say, oh, wow, that's who I was. And it's really interesting. He uses this term, given over. People before Christ would never admit that life has enslaved them. But there comes this point where they realize, wow, I thought I was free, but really I was a slave. I was a slave to all of my desires, my interests. I want to serve a new master. A master who wants what is best for me and wants to transform me into something new. Here's the second way to escape zombie land. 
first of all, make a decision to let Jesus change you, transform you from the inside out. Put off your old self. Put on the new. Again, the Greek verb. Janet, can you help me with my garment bag there? Please? Uh, The Greek verb that's written here is the Greek verb for taking off or putting on a piece of clothing, a garment, or a coat. And this takes place when? The moment you ask Jesus in. It's really interesting. First century culture, they would use this expression, put off, put on, to often refer to behaviors or virtues. In other words, they would use it to say things like this. uh, Put off hate. Put on love. Put off laziness. Put on diligence. But nobody in the first century used it like this. Put off your old self and put on the new self. That was radical. It was radical because of this. The hope of the gospel isn't that Jesus came to give you a makeover or remodel. It's not even that he came to perfect or improve upon what was already there. The hope of the gospel is this. Jesus Christ came to make you entirely, completely new from the inside out. So he appeals to them. Now, it's interesting when he gets later on in this chapter, he's going to refer to a specific set of behaviors. He's going to talk about putting off falsehood or lying, speaking truthfully. Don't sin by letting anger control you. I want you to work hard. I want you to stop stealing. Don't use foul or abusive language. Get rid of rage, anger, bitterness, harsh words, slander, and the like. He's going to get down to some behaviors later on in the chapter, but not Yet, he wants us to know that change doesn't begin with behavior modification. Change begins with inward transformation. Here's the hope of the gospel. Don't get nervous, anybody. Believe me. This body will not be modeled for anybody. But here's what 2 Corinthians, we don't get the reality of this. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It says, when Jesus died, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for our sins in our place. For our sins in our place. Our sin was placed upon him. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us so that in him we could become the righteousness of God in Christ. Oh, if you can ever see what God did for you at the moment of new birth like this, you took off an old filthy, ratty garment. You laid it to the side and he had something a lot better than this 40% off Banana Republic shirt. Thank you, honey. He had a robe of righteousness. And he clothed you in righteousness. And he said, I no longer view you through the lens of your sin. Instead, I've imputed to you, I've given you, I've ascribed to you the righteousness of my son. So when I look at you, I'm looking at you through the lens of Jesus Christ. And because of that, I'll respond to you like I would respond to Jesus. Now, folks, I don't know if you're waiting for a place to say amen or what have you, but that's about as good a place as any. Now, I'm going to have to skip over because of time a whole lot, but let, let, me, let me walk this out. Here's what Jesus does when he changes us from the inside out. First of all, he gives us a new motivation. See, our motivation prior to coming to Jesus, even if you were a moral person, you were not moral because you wanted to please God. Our motivation before coming to Jesus usually boils down to two things, and it's always very religious, fear and pride. Fear, I'll punish you. If I catch you, fear, God is going to smack you around. Anybody remember Johnny Cash's song? God's going to cut you down. That's the way a lot of people view God. 
You could lose your job if you do that. We're motivated by fear or we're motivated by pride. You don't want to be like, and then we begin naming people groups we don't want to be like. But once Christ comes in, the motivation changes. And the motivation is being so captivated by the cross that your desire to live for him flows out of deep gratitude, deep love, deep worship, so that it's, wow, after all he's done for me, why wouldn't I want to live my life so as to honor and worship him? Not only a new motivation, but a new identity. (laughs) This is so good. What forms your identity? Let me let you know something. If your identity is formed by anything, whether it's items checked off on your to-do list, the job you have, the spouse you find, the career you enjoy, if anything other than Christ forms the core of who you are, failure will always be devastating to you. But if you really understand the power of the gospel, who Jesus is and what he accomplished on the cross through the resurrection, you understand that the gospel isn't for those who are morally perfect. It is for failures like us. But we are not defined by our failures. We're defined by what God says about us. Now, for years, I have kept, for years, many, many years, probably a couple of decades, and if I'm missing, messing up on the timeline, I apologize. I've kept a piece by Neil Anderson with me on our identity in Christ. In fact, we've got copies of this for you at the info desk if you want it, and I keep it close to me. And occasionally, I just remind me, because I am in Christ, Christ is in me, this is what God says about me. And it would do you well to remember your identity because of Jesus. Because of Christ, God says, I'm completely accepted. He says, I'm a child of God. I can call God my father. Because I am God's child, I'm an heir of God and a co-heir with his son, Jesus Christ. Because I'm completely accepted, I'm a friend of God. I've been justified by faith, and I have peace with God through Jesus. I'm united with the Lord. I am one in spirit with him. I've been bought with a price, and I belong to God. I'm a member of Christ's body or family. I've been chosen by God, and I've been adopted as God's own child. I've been redeemed and forgiven of all my sin. I am a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. My past is forgiven. The old life forgotten. Everything is new. I have been rescued from the kingdom of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom I have forgiveness, even the remission of all of my sin. I am complete in Christ. I have direct access to the throne of grace through Jesus, and I can be confident that any time I come to that throne, I will find grace and mercy to help in my time of need. That's who we are. Because of Christ. Because Christ is in me and I am in Christ, I'm totally secure. I'm free from condemnation. I am sure that God works all things for my ultimate good and his great glory. I can't be separated from the love of God in Jesus. I have been established, anointed, and sealed by God. My life is hidden with God in Christ. I am confident that God will finish the good work he started in me. I am right now a citizen of heaven. I can find mercy and grace always to help in my time of need. I have not received a spirit of bondage again into fear but because I am in Christ and he is in me I have a sound mind power and love I am born again in Jesus Christ and the evil one can't possibly touch me that's who I am (laughs) wow we're we're getting the howlings going on. That's, 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 that's exciting. Because I am in Christ and Christ is in me. I am deeply significant. Listen, this is who we are because of Christ. Not because of anything we've done. I'm the salt of the earth, the light of the world. I'm part of the true vine. Christ's life flows in me, through me, out of me. I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. I've been chosen and appointed by Jesus to bear much fruit. I have the mind of Christ. He enables me 
me to think right thoughts, make right choices. I am a Holy Spirit empowered agent and witness of Jesus given the mission and assignment of telling everyone the good news that is available in Christ. I am a temple of God. The Holy Spirit lives in me. I am a minister of reconciliation. I've been raised up, seated with Jesus in the heavenly places. I am God's workmanship. I can approach God with freedom and confidence. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am right now a child of God you can't yet see what I will be but when he appears bet on this I will be like him and so will you get this guys this is our identity I can overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb by the word of my testimony because I don't love my life so much as to shrink back from death because of Christ greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world and because of Christ I am right now a king and a priest unto God that is the good news of the gospel <laughs> we get a new identity Second, he gives us a new grid for making decisions. What are you going to base your decision making on? The world, culture, television, programming? Popular culture, conventional wisdom? When you come to Christ, here's what happens. The word of God is established as the foundation upon which all decisions are made. It's not, well, it feels good to me. Well, I think you know, I, I told a group of people a while back, the only thing of value I have to say to this congregation is based on the Word of God. And if I get out of kilter with this book, you need to know, can it? Can it? This is our only source. Let me give you the last two points, and I'll close with a story. Uh, first, make a decision. Secondly, let Jesus transform you from the inside out. Three, renew your mind. That's what he says in verse 23. Uh, the NIV says, be made new in the attitude of your mind. The ESV nails it here. It says, be made new in the spirit of your mind. Anybody a classic kind of rock guy? I don't know that this is, this is classic rock, but uh, it's, it's maybe a couple of decades old. Maybe not that old. I'm not sure. Uh, Sister Hazel, change your mind. Anybody like that? Yeah, cool song. If you want to be somebody else, you know the guy's got a nasally kind of uh, delivery, but it's really good, right? If you're tired of fighting battles with yourself, if you want to be somebody else, change your mind. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. that song I, I, I can't remember the lyrics it's so awesome though because he's nailed it here and it's interesting to me he says be renewed in other words this isn't something we do alone we make ourselves available to God for him to renew our mind I, I want to give you this and then I'll, I'll give you the fourth point as James comes on up uh St. Augustine, you can learn a lot about some of these truths from some guys who lived a long time ago. St. Augustine, he was something of a sex addict before he came to Jesus. I mean, he was really messed up. He would fit the description in verses 17 through 19 to a T. He would fit it. And a couple of years after his conversion and change, he was in a city he hadn't been to for some time. And one of his old mistresses came running up to him and began to be very sensual and flirtatious with Augustine. And Augustine was really polite to her. He was very kind to her. He was very nice to her. But he didn't respond the way he once would have responded. He once would have groped her become very sensual with her almost immediately. But he didn't respond the way he used to respond. And she was confused. Oh, what, what, why, why didn't he grab me? What, why doesn't he want me? What's, what's wrong? So she had an idea and she called out to him. And I, I love this story. But Augustine, it is I. And I love this. He 
turned around and said, I know. But it is not I. Do you get what he's saying? He's saying, I'm you. Not the same guy I used to be. He was being made renewed in the spirit of his mind. And here's four. If you really want to leave zombie land in the rear view, um, stay focused on Jesus. Check out verse 20 if you would. That, however, is not the way you learned, the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ. Uh, the ESV puts it this way. The ESV says, but that is not the way you learned Christ. And even the message paraphrase paraphrases it this way. You learned Christ. And several scholars and commentaries all agree that Ephesians 4.20 could be translated, in fact, should be translated, you did not learn Christ this way. In fact, two of the commentaries I read said, no parallel exists in the literature of that era for learning a person. Another commentary said, the phrase for learning a person doesn't appear anywhere else in the Greek Bible, and to date, it hasn't been traced to any pre-biblical literature. You did not learn Christ. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, you want to leave zombie land. You know more than facts about Jesus. You know Jesus. You have a first-hand knowledge of him as a living person, not just history, not just theory. And you know how radically different his life is. You know what he's telling us? He's telling us this. Be captivated by Jesus. Now, the writer of Hebrews would say it this way. Remember, we're talking to people who want to be made new. Since we are such surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us, here's the terminology again, strip off. You know what? This is a finished reality. This happened the moment you became a believer. But it does no harm for you when you get up in the morning to just remind yourself. I'm stripping off the weight, the sin that so easily besets me. Right now, I put off the old self. You've already accomplished that fact. So right now, I just, I just put it off. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes. The NIV says fixing our eyes. It's this. It's being captivated by Jesus. Oh, I want to tell you guys. And Ben, would you come? I want to tell you. Leaving zombie land in the rear view is about being captivated by Jesus. Oh, I mean being captivated. I mean being captivated by Jesus. Where you keep looking to the cross. You keep looking to the resurrection. You keep looking to who he is. You keep looking to know more of him. You keep looking for him to define you. You keep your eyes fixated on him through trouble, through trial through temptation, you're fixed, you're focused on Jesus. And at some point, Philippians 1, 6 says, you'll reach the destination and you'll look back and think, oh, wow. The work he did in me. And you won't even notice the work taking place because your focus isn't you, your focus is him. That's why a guy called me after we, at the completion of one of our 21-day fasts in the past. And he said, man, God, he did a work in my life today. He's a really, a guy who came out of a really tough background. Was, was raised way down, 
Miami, grew up around a lot of people who cursed a whole lot, didn't really know Jesus until he was well into his 40s. And he told me the 21st day of the fast, God, God really came through for him in a big way. And, and then he said to me on the phone, he said, man, I think the next thing, and this guy cusses a lot, like cussed a lot. Like we'd be at small group and in small group, he would drop a few really interesting words. It always livened up the small group experience, I must admit. Made it really interesting. And I don't just mean the barnyard, I mean some big words. Just like he would say some of them, and then he would immediately say, Oh, Pastor, I'm sorry. Which I hate. I, here's the deal I'd rather you be you as be a fake when you're around me. Is that okay? Just, just be you. I'm not offended. Jesus can handle it. I can handle it. And he said to me, he said, man, man, God just came through big time. And, and you know what? I think my goal for this year is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit cussing. And I called him by his first name. I said, that's, that's awesome. But can I give you a recommendation? Don't focus on not cussing. If your focus is not cussing, you'll probably find yourself cussing more often than you cuss now. Would you do me a favor? Just focus on Jesus. I mean, just, just be captivated by Jesus. And something happens when you're captivated by Jesus. You know what happens? You turn around like three months down the road and you look back and say, Wow, I haven't been cussing. What? Because your focus has changed. You've taken off the old and you've put on the new. Father, in Jesus' name, do that work among us. Help us to put zombie land in the rear view. Help people today to make a decision. Help them to let Jesus transform them from the inside out. Father, I pray that they would be renewed in their mind by focusing on what you say about them and for I pray that they would stay focused on, they would be captivated by Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Now, if you need to make a step towards Jesus, I'm going to invite you to pray. Just pray this prayer aloud and together, not alone. Faith family at A2, would you say this out loud? Just say this out loud. Heavenly Father, thank you that because of the gospel, I can be made new. Not just a remodel, not just a renovation, but entirely, completely new. A new motivation, a new identity, a new grid for making decisions. I receive the new life offered in Christ. Thank you, because He died, He was buried, He was raised. I can become different. I make a decision. I will follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Now I'm going to invite you to stand together, if you would. I'm going to ask Justin to lead us in our closing song. And I pray at this moment, your focus would be Jesus. You would be captivated by Jesus. Prayer partners, I'm going to ask you right after Justin has finished leading us in this song, I'm going to ask you towards the end of it to come stand here. Let's be available to serve our body. If you've got anything you need to pray about, we want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. But right now, for the next few moments, let's live out this fourth principle. Let's stay focused on Jesus. Just and lead us.
the road ahead gets steep, I will lift these hands and pray. I will believe. I remind myself of all that you've done. Love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. I am yours. I am forever yours. Mountain high or valley low, I sing out and remind my soul that.
came down and you rescued me. Love came down and you set me free. I am yours. I am forever yours. Mountain high or valley low, I sing out in my, my soul. Other prayer partners that are in the room, come on down and help us out. God bless you. We hope you have a good day. If you need people to pray for you, prayer partners will be here by the time you arrive. God bless you and have a good day.